Welcome to the CEC report for the 16th of November 2018. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Elisa. It's been a while. It has. Welcome <laughs> back. And on today's show we have Who Do You Want in Control When the Housing Bubble Bursts? And Victoria Defies Spy Agencies to Join Belt and Road. So firstly, who do you want in control when the housing bubble bursts? Now the question is, is it going to be the banks who dictate terms when the financial markets collapse in the coming period? There's warnings globally of a new global financial crisis, Mark II. The Australian housing bubble could even be the trigger of that. Um, so do we want the banks in control or do we want the government to take action that puts the people ahead of the banks? That's what we want to discuss firstly today. Um, now, just firstly, a few warnings, um, the latest on the housing bubble front. We had UBS analyst Jonathan Mott, who has mapped out five scenarios for a housing crash this week. In his worst scenario, which he terms a deep recession, housing prices would, would plunge by 30%, and that's likely a conservative estimate, according to many experts. Um, he says that currently we're headed for his third scenario, which is a housing correction but the risk of a credit crunch, he said, is real and is rising. Uh, he also said the housing credit squeeze experienced over the last six months is expanding. The outlook for the banks has not been as challenged since at least 2008. Now, another warning comes from veteran analyst Louis Christopher of SQM Research. Uh, he was reacting to Sydney auction clearance rates, which are headed for 30 year lows. He said, this is getting almost unprecedented. It's certainly unprecedented in the last 20 years. I just cannot see any trigger which is going to create a bottom in the market in Sydney and Melbourne right now. All I can see are factors out there which could make this even worse. Now add to that Martin North from Digital Finance Economics. He told a UBS investment conference in Sydney that the number of first home buyers has already halved from three months ago. Uh, he also referred to investors holding multiple properties who may be forced to sell in large numbers and we're talking affluent households here that have been drawn into the bubble mm -hmm. and they're now coming across conditions that would tempt them to sell. And Martin North said, I am expecting to see some unnatural acts that kick the can down the road like creating first home buyer opportunities, trying to get people to come back into the market. So obviously that's what the banks will be hoping for and what the government will be oriented to in the coming period to try to keep this bubble up at all costs, especially till the election. Well, that's right, Lisa. Look, the, I think the marker is this, is we've got a bill in Parliament right now, which is to separate the banks along the old Glass-Steagall model. That is, break up the banks, pr protect the retail or commercial aspect of banking, right? That's just normal, boring banking. It's what banks always used to be. It's where the credit is pr produced for the, or you know, the money is lent out for the ordinary economy. And then you've got the speculative side, which is your investment and in merchant banking and everything else, re, um, insurance houses, stockbroking houses, that have been sort of put into the banks, into one big conglomerate. That all gets broken out because most of that activity, the investment in merchant banking, is highly, highly speculative, which is causing the problem. It's the reason that the, market, that the housing market has been, you know, uh, become so high is because yeah. of the lending policies of the banks. Now, you separate out the retail commercial side of uh, the banking system from the investment banking system. That's the first thing. We've got a bill in Parliament to do that. So the real marker for people is if they want the government to control the banking system, they've got to get active ring up their members in Parliament and say, look, we want this, bar this, this bill passed. Mm -hmm. Because right now, you know, there's a lot of, uh, these politicians are still believing a lot of the hype that they're being told by the Reserve Bank, by APRA and ASIC and so the regulators, right, which Kenneth Haynes and his Royal Commission have shown to be absolutely negligent. And that's actually putting it in, in, in mild terms, right? Mm. And so but there's other policies that have to be brought out too. You can't allow the banks to run a, a policy of controlling the economy, which is what's happened to date. Because you know, back in the 1930s, Ben Chifley sat on the Royal Commission. He was a very famous you know, Prime Minister and Treasurer of the past in the 1940s. And he wrote a dissenting report into the banking system, which he basically said, you cannot allow the private banking system 
that only has the interests of its shareholders at stake to make decisions that run the economy for everyone, like mm -hmm. for the general welfare. So this is a real this is a real principle. Now it's, it's our politicians, our people in the, that are going to make the decisions. They're going to mm -hmm. say, okay, well that principle holds, or we're going to have a complete free market operation to control whatever downturn we're heading to, whatever type or however fast that is. If we allow the banks to be in control, then we're going to get more of the criminality mm -hmm. that you've seen with the Royal Commission. And in a crisis, that's going to be dire. Now, we've got to take a quick break, but right after this, we're going to discuss the bad poli policy decisions that have been made in the last few decades. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC report where we're discussing who should be in control at the point this housing bubble of ours bursts. Now we want to look at the recent period because there's policy decisions that have been made and three major ones I want to point to today that have put us in a real dire situation that's brought this crisis on and we're at another policy decision point now really where if the right decision is not made uh, history you know, is going to look very different to what it could be. So we're going to talk about, firstly, the repeal of Glass-Steagall. That was a critical decision point. Um, secondly, the response to the global financial crisis, which comes in two parts. The bailout and quantitative easing program, which made matters much, much worse. And then the bail-in, the decision to go with the bail-in of depositors and of bank creditors to save the bank's skin. So the takedown of Glass-Steagall, firstly, um, this first came under proposal in December 1984 when JP Morgan put out an inter internal memo rethinking Glass-Steagall. Uh, Alan Greenspan was one of the directors at that time of the bank and he was one of the key authors of that program. One of the things he referenced was the revolution that was occurring in the financial services markets. Which uh, means more, more speculation, more gambling. Well, exactly. And he said that that demanded that rigid segmentation be rethought. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he pointed to was securitisation, which would allow ordinary banks to bundle up and resell uh, all kinds of debt. And then that can be then sold and sold again and securitised and derivatised over and over, basically. Um, so three years after this paper, Greenspan became head of the Federal Reserve and immediately pushed for the repeal of Glass-Steagall. But before 1999, it was already well and truly eroded away. He quickly allowed banks to engage in securitisation. In, it was already happening in a small degree in the 1970s with mortgages. By the 80s, it was applied across many other sectors, other kinds of loans like auto loans, and it really took off in the 1990s. Um, and there, from there, he eroded various other regulations allowing commercial and investment banks to merge, for instance, before it was repealed in 1999. Now, I want to show a couple of clips of people warning against what would happen uh, if this went ahead. And the first is from Pam Martins giving testimony before the Federal Reserve in June 1998. And Pam Martins worked on Wall Street for 21 years and became an outspoken critic of its corrupt practices. And today we collaborate with her in the United States actually. So here she is. It was just 60 years ago that 4,835 of America's banks went broke and closed their doors leaving shareholders and depositors destitute. The underlying reason that this happened was the lack of moral courage by our regulators and elected representatives to just say no to powerful moneyed interests. Instead of just saying no, Washington handed the banks the equivalent of an ATM card to the Fed's discount window to speculate in stocks. At a time when Japan, the second largest industrialized nation, is reliving the 1930s in America, complete with banking insolvency, it is amazing and preposterous that we should be discussing rolling back Glass-Steagall. We also want to remember that the political dynamics that created the backdrop for the banking meltdown in the 30s grew from a corrupt, cozy culture between Wall Street and Washington. U.S. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, who knew a thing or two about the matter, having just served as chairman of the young new SEC before he went to the Supreme Court, he called it what it was, chicanery and corruption. Frank Vanderlip, coincidentally, an actual former president of National City Bank, 
wrote in the Saturday Evening Post at the time that lack separation of banking and securities contributed to the stock market losing 90 percent. I'd like to repeat that. 90 percent of its value from 1929 to 1933. The public was so sickened by the hubris and corruption that an entire generation stayed away from the stock market. It was not until 1954, 25 years later, that Wall Street once again reached the level it had set in 1929. There is a compelling body of evidence that suggests a corrupt, cozy culture has once again enveloped the brains of Washington. We can hardly look to the safekeepers of the public trust when they are falling over themselves to reap campaign windfalls from Wall Street. Washington and regulators are quick to criticize moral hazard when it's on foreign shores. Let's look at the moral hazard incubating at Travelers in Smith Barney. In 1996, when the SEC and the Justice Department found that Smith Barney was one of 24 firms fleecing their own customers through six or more years of price fixing, no one went to jail. When, within the last two years, when a special prosecutor found that Smith Barney had bribed the former U.S. Agriculture Secretary, again, no one went to jail. The firm is currently under investigation by various municipalities for the fraudulent markup of Treasury securities. And that, in fact, is enough to hold up this merger since a criminal charge against a primary dealer of Treasury securities would lend its taint to one of America's major money center banks. So not much has changed, Lisa. No, that cosy culture is there in spades today. Uh, now, Bernie Sanders also protested against this. Byron Dorgan, Senator, uh, we'll watch a clip of him here in late 1999, just before the repeal was passed. I worry very much that the, the fusing together of the idea of banking, which requires not just safety and soundness to be successful, but the perception of safety and soundness, but, it, but to, to merge it with inherently risky speculative activity is, in my judgment, unwise. There are some notions that represent transcendental truths that are true over time. And one of those, in my judgment, I fervently believe, is that we are, with this piece of legislation, moving towards greater risk. We are almost certainly moving towards substantial new concentration and mergers in the financial services industry. That is almost certainly not in the interest of consumers. And we are deliberately and certainly with this legislation moving towards inheriting much greater risk in our financial services industries. And so I come to the floor to say that I regret that I cannot support the legislation. Um, I think we will, in 10 years' time, look back and say we should not have done that because we forgot the lessons of the past. So then after the repeal of Glass-Steagall, things really went downhill. We didn't heed those warnings. Um, following the global financial crisis, the decision to go with policies that would allow the banks to get straight back into the speculative travesty that they'd been conducting mm -hmm. has led us to an even greater disaster. Nomi Prins, another former Wall Street banker, wrote extensively about this in her new book, Collusion, where she talks about the setup between um, central banks worldwide, some of the world's biggest too big to fail banks, and governments colluding to create an incredible concentration of power in the hands of the banks. And quantitative easing exacerbated the problem because it flooded money into those banks to allow them to conduct an even greater range of speculation. China did challenge this by putting out its own form of quantitative easing into real productive development and infrastructure. But we're also at a point now where that question for the world, whether we go, which direction we go in, real development, real physical economy, or more speculation is up for grabs because the third policy decision, Craig, which I wanted to mention, is bail-in um, because that decision, as we mentioned earlier, 
has even put the people further uh, down uh, the list of people who are going to be, you know, benefiting at the point of the global, the new global financial crisis that's oncoming. Yeah, the watchword here, Lisa, is called financial stability. This is the mandate, so-called, of the uh, of APRA, financial stability of the system. And if people think that means that means that somehow you're going to be protected, your 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 savings are going to be protected. Mm. Forget it. It's all very, very clear from all the work that we've done as part of our bailing campaign since 2013. The intention is through this policy of financial stability enforced by APRA, they will steal your deposits. Exactly, to save the banking system yet again. So this policy moment we're at now is decisive. Kenneth Hayne can make a big impact on it, but you can make a big impact on it too. Most of our viewers have probably already you know, written to their MP about this organise other people to do the same. We've got to spread that process like a mushroom so that the politicians know they are answerable to us and not the banks. That's where the power actually lies. So we'll stop there and we'll be yeah. right back to talk about um, how Victoria has taken a step to break this cycle. Welcome back to the CEC Report. Victoria defies spy agencies to join Belt and Road. So our media was in much of a flap over the last couple of weeks uh, over the fact that the Victorian government not only joined uh, the Belt and Road, which is China's program to bring continents together um, with connectivity of infrastructure of all kinds and collaboration for mutual benefit um, the world over really, but also they were in a flap over the fact that the Victorian government didn't immediately release the memorandum of understanding of what they agreed to with the Chinese to the public, which is not even really a usual thing to do. Mm. A lot of agreements, such agreements are kept quiet, particularly with PPPs and treaties like the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and even the agreement the federal government signed with China on collaboration for infrastructure in third countries is still not public. Um, so that kept the media going for a little bit, but now the um, agreement has been released and it talks about the promotion of infrastructure, trade, investment, common development. It doesn't actually commit us to any particular project or initiative. It's very open and it just shows a spirit of collaboration. Um, and even Trade Minister Simon Birmingham um, unexpectedly welcomed Victoria's initiative at the um, International Import Expo that was held in China over the last week where Australia, 150 Australian companies were in attendance. Yeah. Um, but still Australia is only cooperating at arm's length and I want to talk about a, a new research paper was put out by Professor James Lawrenceson from the Australia-China Relations Institute at the, at the Sydney University of Technology. Uh, and what he reveals, and you can read more about it in our Australian Alert Service, and make sure you do call in for a free copy of that if you haven't already to get all the background information that we base the show on. But his uh, report actually shows that most China scare stories are completely unfounded. And he gave a talk about this paper uh, at Sydney University of Technology. And he talked about how the media misconstrues a lot of indisputable facts, such as the fact that only 2.6% of party political party donations actually come from China. You'd think it was 92% the way the media yeah. talk. Um, and he said the media go straight to ASPE, um, the Australia Strategic Policy Institute. He said, I wish they would go to the experts rather than to the loudest voices. And I want to show an audio clip from this presentation where a question was asked by a former Four Corners executive producer, Peter Manning. Uh, and we'll just listen to what he had to say. So that, I guess that's, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to start bashing the media, but gee, I wish the Australian media would at least, and look, some, some do this better than others, but as a general point, I wish they would go to experts rather than the loudest voices. Next question, Peter Manning. Um, I'm a uh, former executive producer of Four Corners. Uh, I've made Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I've made, I've made my, my life uh, investigative journalism in right. one way or another. Um, and in that kind of journalism, of course, sources are everything. Mm. Uh, and checking, double-checking, triple-checking your sources before you make an allegation before you use the facts before you to make the allegation. Mm. And I think one of the changes that's occurred under the uh, new media circumstances that we're in 
is that there's a new form of journalism called, which Columbia University calls access journalism rather than investigative journalism. And the access journalism is getting a good leak from an organisation. And where do most of those leaks come from? This is not just in Australia. They come from intelligence sources um, who cannot then, and often under the Act, a, a, a Terrorism Act or you know, a Journalism Act or whatever, they cannot uh, reveal their sources, mm. the, the sources beyond the source, so to speak, so the documents. Mm. So what you get, and there's a good example of it in today's Sydney Morning Herald, actually, the, the scoop about this woman who was paying off the United Nations president. And if you look at a, a lot of the words that are used about alleged, mm. sources say um, uh, this has been lifted from such and such. But the documents showing these things, quite apart from the court documents, are not shown in the article. So... You as a reader, unlike investigative journalism, which was the way it was done and, and often is still done by Four Corners, um, it, you don't get to see the actual people who are saying these things. Mm. Um, and when you get uh, Australian security resor uh, uh, services and the FBI being put together and American court cases and you don't hear the other side of the court mm. cases... Uh, and the defence and so on and so on. It's not only bad court reporting, it's actually taking a line about what, you know, these particular intelligence agencies want said. So, Craig, that's pretty blatant, and we actually had the same thing being said by John Menadue recently, uh, back in May, and he was an official, of course, in both the Whitlam and Fraser governments, he had said that ASIO is pretty much running our foreign policy on China and feeding the line directly to journalists on the so-called China threat. Um, we've also had reports from Reuters in October that, and they cite sources, of course. Yeah. Um, they say that the Five Eyes, the US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand spying alliance has been holding talks beneath the radar intelligence, diplomatic, government, heads of government and so forth to exchange classified information about China's foreign activities. Mm -hmm. So this is a big topic of debate. We've got Vice President from the United States, Mike Pence, coming down here. He's pushing the same China scare line. Um, Asian historian Dr David Brophy just said a lot of the Chinese influence stuff is about ensuring Australia stays in lockstep with the US. Yes. We've got to break that lockstep. Absolutely, Lisa. Look, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is involving so many, uh, you know, 150 countries or something like that. It is what is developing this sector, you know, the Asian sector. And you have to look at it. We're in a Victorian election right now, mm. right? What the uh, Andrews government done is very good with this, you know, aligning ourselves with the Belt and Road. But the, this, the China scare, the operation of the intelligence agencies to create this China scare, that's what is being used politically to try and damage a very good initiative on behalf of the Victorian government. So people should be aware of this, that they, they're being used, um, again, by the intelligence agencies to push what we call a British policy, mm. British policy of free trade and not the Belt and Road Initiative. And we've got to think about, just like with the bank story we had up front, who do we want in control of our policy and do we want that policy to be what's best for the population yeah. or for select special interests? That's the question. So... That's all we've got time for this week, but be sure to call us if you haven't already and get involved. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Join us again next week. Mm -hmm.